I thought I was from the hood till I seen Brooklyn, Jesus Christ. I got off the train, I said, is this the book of Eli? What happened? I feel you. Ayo, hey, LAZ, download two of my greatest albums that I ever put out in my life on my Patreon right now. As above, so below, and blue skies. Free download on my Patreon. Join today. Here. Oh, Hey yo, LAZ, make sure you subscribe to WDG Draco on YouTube. Hey yo, shout out to the bro Truth Parker, currently incarcerated in Virginia. You heard, make sure you check out his podcast, Truth Beyond These Walls. And that's a whole fact, Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man. Make sure you check that all truth parker stories playlist too you heard if you want to catch up on about seven eight other joints we done dropped so far you heard but yeah man laz this is the story of dj for show aka truth parker now i mean one of the biggest mixtape djs that was doing it when i was doing it you heard when that mixtape game was serious when dudes was making millions of dollars off the mixtape hustle you heard pay attention to this story you might learn something z lord get at me i wound up starting to pump mixtapes out of these spots like crack in the 80s man i'm talking about making a couple thousand dollars a day the shit was amazing to me you know i mean who would have thought i'd be slinging mix CDs and making more money than some of these hand-to-hand -hand drug dealer niggas that was making or sitting on the corners in their hoods, you know, and, and being a whole lot safer too. And then let's not forget, you know, I'm still supplying my network of stores all across VA as well. So. All right, so check it out, man. Uh, I know I've mentioned you know, numerous times other stories about my former career as a DJ, you know, and getting the world to recognize and know me as DJ for sure. Well, you know, I figured it was time to probably actually make y'all aware of how all that took place, you know, and how that shit actually changed my life and the aspect of, you know, getting me all the way out of the streets, you know, and giving me the opportunity to put some legal big bread in my pocket, you know, and at the same time, gain a whole lot of exposure and recognition and allow me the chance to get to know and work with a lot of your favorite rappers, you know, both mainstream and underground. I never really told this whole story before to nobody, so for those that do actually know me, you know, and, and have followed my career, I know some of this shit ain't gonna come as no surprise to you, you know, but for those who don't know me or have never heard of me, you know, and are just now being made familiar from these stories that I be talking to St. Laz about on YouTube, you know, just follow along because it's a pretty interesting journey, you know, how I made a transition from being out in these streets heavy to using hip hop, you know, and my DJing abilities to make an exit from those very same streets, but still use my hustle mentality, you know, and turn my craft into a huge lucrative bag and respectable career. So, first and foremost, you know, let me just state the fact that I started DJing when I was like 11, 12 years old. All right. I'm talking about real DJing, you know what I mean? Two turntables and a mixer, scratching records, mixing, blending, transforming, backspinning, all that. You know, I had an uncle at the time who ran around with the original uh, legendary DJ Cheese. Now, I know a lot of y'all probably gonna have to Google him to actually see who I'm talking about, but just to give you an idea, you know, this was a dude that used to put on handcuffs behind his back and still do tricks on the turntables blindfolded without missing a beat and my uncle learned from him you know who in turn taught me everything he knew and you know back in those days it wasn't no ipods and no itunes and making no playlists and no shit like that you know everything was manual hands-on you had to really have a feel for those turntables and those records you know and you had to be fast and on point and i'm gonna get to why that was important to the story in a minute but i just wanted to make it known that you know, I definitely held a skill set that's mostly obsolete nowadays, you know, when it comes to someone being called a DJ. And, um, you know, 
know, even though I ain't been on a set of turntables in a long time, trust me, that shit is like riding a bike. You know what I mean? I could hop on a set of Technique 12s right now and rock out. And it'll have niggas pulling out their phones, you know, trying to record some shit and put it on live or YouTube or anything like that. No bullshit. Anyway, so, you know, like I mentioned before in the past, you know, even though I was small time hustling at the time, I had always been DJing, you know, all through middle school and the high school. I used to DJ little backyard parties and cookouts around the way a lot. You know, back then it was me and my man Dangerous, you know, we used to be rocking out, practicing, battling each other for hours at a time. You know, either at his crib or mine's, you know, you know, that was just something that we enjoyed doing. So even though hustling in the streets kind of had made its way to the forefront of my life, DJing always still held a real heavy part of my heart, you know, even just as a hobby. You know, I used to find myself, you know, sneaking into parties sometimes, me and Dangerous. We wouldn't even be in the crowd trying to dance or feel on girls or none of that, you know what I mean? We'd be posted up next to where the DJ was set up, watching, criticizing, critiquing, you know, each and every mix and transition and scratch that they would do, or even the records that they would play, you know, as if we were so much better. Sometimes, you know, dudes would get annoyed with us, but other times, you know, guys would actually just challenge us and allow us to get up on their set, you know, and show them what we got. And we love that shit because, you know, we both just take turns on their ass and put on a show of our own. You know, and this would be grown ass men, mind you. You know, here we are, 12, 13 years old, getting busy, you know, and had a crowd like cheering us on and shit. You know, you know, to think about it today, I wouldn't even say it was the fact that we was that much better than whoever. You know, I think it might have just been the fact that we was just so young, posing a challenge to these older niggas, and then, you know, getting up on their sets and doing some of the same shit or more that they was already doing, and then not missing a beat doing it, you know? Anyway, you know, that type of shit had a nigga's ego on 10,000 for real. You know, you couldn't tell if he wasn't lit. Now... I'm going to give you a little history for a second, because I got to mention the fact that I grew up in Jersey, you know, and I frequented New York quite a bit, and recording the uh, radio hip-hop shows on Kiss FM and WBLS on Friday and Saturday nights was like a regular thing for me. You know, DJ Red Alert, Molly Maul, Mr. Magic, Super DJ Clark Kent, they used to have me mesmerized, you know, and hypnotized and glued to the radio. And I would record every week's show, you know, on my little cassette tapes, and I'd listen to them all week long in my little boombox radio until the next weekend, you know, and then I would stuff little pieces of paper in the top of the cassette and record them all over again. Now, I know anybody that's listening that's 40 years or old is going to relate and know what I'm talking about, you know, and this was like way before Power and Hot 97 and Spotify and instant internet streaming and all that shit, you know what I mean? So let me fast forward a little bit because from there I can remember when the mixtapes started becoming hot commodities in the hood. You know, DJs like Kid Capri and Ron G, SNS, Doo DJ Juice. You know, there was a few others, but they was all putting out mixtape cassettes. And I used to make trips downtown North, you know, to the electronic stores where they sold all the car stereo stuff and the radios and TVs and shit like that. Because they would have these little mixtape booths set up outside the stores with all the latest tapes from the hottest DJs at the time. And that's probably when I really became a mixtape junkie, for real. So, besides me and Dangerous, you know, making our own mixes and recording them, you know, I also started collecting all the DJs' mixtapes. You know, and then, you know, later on came more DJs like Clue and Green Lantern, Envy, K Slade, Tony Touch, Funk Flex. You know, a whole lot of other dudes follow suit. It's way too many of them to name, though. But check it out. I actually remember this specific tape that I had um, that Kay Slay put out once. And it had a recording of a phone conversation between him and another DJ. I think the nigga name was DJ Splash, if I'm not mistaken. Anyhow, Slay was barking on the nigga, you know, about something and calling him all out his name and calling him outside saying he was going to smack the shit out of the dude. You know, I want to say he was like right outside the nigga's crib or something like that, because that, that's the way he made it seem on the tape. Now, whether he actually smacked dude or not, I don't know. Obviously, because, you know, this was just a recording. But it was after that particular incident when he started adding the smack your favorite DJ to his name. 
Now that's a piece of some hip hop history for your ass. You know, rest in peace to K Slate. Anyhow, you know, all these DJs I mentioned, they was actually really DJing live on their takes, you know, really spinning records, scratching and shit. You know, I ain't even really have an official DJ name yet at that time, but I considered myself to be like an honorary student of the craft. So that's kind of real important for y'all to keep in mind as the story goes on. All right, so now let me fast forward again, you know, all the way to when I made my transition out to VA. And shortly thereafter, you know, is when I started hustling out there. But in my spare time, you know, I was still spinning records, you know, perfecting my craft as a DJ and all that. I actually used to set up turntables and speakers inside one of my weed spots at the time. And I would be in there smoking and bagging up and selling dime bags all day, getting to the bread. But then I'm spinning records and shit in my downtime. You know, my point is, even though I had gotten myself knee deep in the streets out there in VA, you know, I was still working my turntables religiously. You know, I never stopped doing that. And I say all that to say, you know, that the passion never left, even though, you know, making street money had kind of taken to the forefront of my life. Now, let me fast forward again, because as time went by, you know, the turntables did eventually take a back seat to everything else I had going on, especially when I opened up my first store called The Lion's Den. So oddly enough, though, you know, I set up a pair of turntables in the store to play with and spin live for customers every now and then. You know, plus I sold reggae records there too, so it kind of gave the customers a chance to listen to the records before they purchased them. Now, also in the store, you know, I'm also selling all the top DJs mixtapes. You know, I had a whole wall dedicated to nothing but mixtapes. Only now, you know, it was CDs. And I stocked all the DJs that I named before. Plus now you had dudes like DJ Drama and Who Kid and Cutmaster C, DJ On Point, Lazy K, Domination, Pudgy P, J Arms and Sycamore, they did the instrumentals. Then you had Rondon and Dexterity with the reggae mixes, you know, and a whole bunch more. So, you know, it was around this time when I had decided to open up my very own studio and create my own record label called Dangerous Records. And I had a small roster of artists, you know, and I would reach out to some of these DJs and I'd send them music and a little bread, of course, you know, and get my artists on some of these mixtape track lists. In turn, you know, I would buy a stack of the CDs when they dropped, and then I would sell them in my store just to make the money back and then do it all over again. So I constantly had my artists on some of the biggest DJs' tapes all the time. You know, and you got to understand, too, at that time, that was truly the outlets and the platforms to get your shit heard and your name noticed. You know what I mean? It was no, it was no Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, SoundCloud. You know, none of that shit existed yet. So... This was really all like ground level guerrilla marketing, so to speak, you know. So anyway, you know, it was at this time that I started to build a relationship with a particular guy named DJ Watts out of Brooklyn. And, you know, uh, dude was moving a lot of units, you know, hand to hand in BK. Plus, you know, his shit was hitting all the bootleg tables on Canal Street and all the other spots across the city, too. And he wound up taking a real liking, you know, to the music that we was putting out. So my artist... You know, we started doing like exclusive freestyles for him on the regular, putting his name in the raps and all that. You know, the very same way that the DJs that came before him would get artists to drop exclusive joints that only they had or could play because the DJ's name was getting shouted out all over the record. You know, that kind of made it exclusively they joint. Plus, you know, he wasn't charging me as much as some of these other DJs for the promo. And I could see with my own eyes, you know, that his product was in the same places as all these other top DJs, too. So we started working with him more and more. You know, one thing led to another, and I wound up inviting him out to VA for a weekend, you know, to record a whole exclusive freestyle mixtape with all my artists in the studio for him to put it out, you know, under his brand. So he came out, you know, I rolled out the red carpet for the nigga, you know, him and his right-hand man, Skrilla. You know, them niggas had a fucking ball that weekend. You know, monumental shit for all of us, for real. We did a whole lot of recording and smoking, a little drinking, partying and all of that. You know, them niggas got to see firsthand how I moved and got down to VA and how my team worked in the lab. You know, and it's crazy because I got to actually see some monumental shit that weekend too. Fucked my head up totally. You know, and it would definitely change the way I saw niggas from that point on with DJ attached to their name. So what I mean is, 
you know, it was a particular time during that weekend that I had invited Watts to hop on my set of turntables, you know, and let me see him do his thing live. Well, my intentions, you know, was to hop on right after him and show him that I knew a few things too and I could work the tables probably just as good, if not better than him. Because, you know, up until that point, he didn't even know that I could DJ. You know, and this wasn't on no competition shit or nothing like that. You know, it was more so just like for the wow factor. You know what I mean? Well, what actually happened was the nigga said he ain't know nothing about turntables. And he didn't even know the first thing about spinning no records, let alone cutting, scratching, and mixing. So I'm like, what? You know, I got the crazy puzzled look on my face. You know what I mean? Like, what, what you mean you don't know nothing about turntables? He was like, yeah. You know, I don't use no turntables to make my shit. I just gather up music, put it on my, put, put my songs all in a playlist, you know, and add some voice drops and make a dope cover and put that shit out. That's how it's done nowadays. Hey, yo, lads, man. <laughs> I couldn't believe my fucking ears, bro. I'm like, yo, get the fuck out of here. You playing, right? And he's like, nah, I'm dead ass. Like, I just couldn't fathom the idea of a nigga putting those two letters DJ, you know, in front of their name, but don't know how to DJ. You know, call me old school or whatever, but that shit was brand new to me. You know, and I ain't like it one bit. It messed me up big time. You know, I couldn't fucking believe it. But, you know, be that as it may, we finished out the weekend, you know what I mean? We put the mixtape together, he put it out. And then shortly after that was when my store got raided. You know what I mean? My studio got shut down, building got closed, and I went on the run. So all that shit that I talked about with you in the other story called uh, On the Run from the Feds in the State. All right, so moving ahead a little bit, you know, I wound up getting caught up. One of my artists and my sidekick, they both get jammed up on the robbery. I wound up beating my case and wound up coming home to nothing, you know, but I still got thoughts about how I'm going to bounce back. All right. Well, damn, I should have mentioned earlier, too, that I was also rapping and spitting, too. And, you know, that I also happened to be like a major component in my whole label situation. And uh, at this time, you know, I still got the hunger and the passion to want to chase my rap dreams. But now, you know, I ain't got the bread to be spending with these DJs to put my shit on their mixtapes the way I was doing before the raid happened and all that. I don't even got no studio to record in no more or no DJ equipment to even begin with. But I got a computer, you know, and I got an idea. So... I wound up going to Sam Ash or Guitar Center, one of them shit, I don't remember which one. And I bought me a good microphone and a stand, you know, in the Pro Tools program. Now I had already gotten familiar with Pro Tools by watching my engineer at the studio use it. So I knew the basics of recording a session, you know, and um, at least enough to record something. And then I figured I could possibly just figure the rest out. So I basically just took a fast hands-on crash course in Pro Tools 101, so to speak. You know, and I figured out how to work that shit in no time. Now, my idea was, I'm going to record my own freestyles and then create mixtapes with all the latest songs and the biggest artists, but then feature my own music in the track list. You know, get a dope cover done under some fictitious DJ name, put the shit out and sell them hand to hand so I could make my money back. And besides, you know, according to Watts, shit, it was no need to be a real DJ no more to gain popularity or a following. You know, all you had to do was have a great cover and the right music that people wanted to hear. So, I wound up coming up with the name DJ for Show, VA's Best Kept Secret. The secret being that it was really me, Truth, the artist, behind putting the tapes together and acting like it was some other nigga named DJ for Show that was putting me on all his mixtapes. Now, my sole intention for doing what I was doing, it wasn't to gain any recognition as a DJ, you know what I mean? but rather to get other DJs and fans and buyers of mixtapes to recognize Truth the Rapper with the dope intros and freestyles on all the DJ for show mixtapes and hopefully get at me to do the same type of shit for them. You know, that was my plan to gain exposure and a little recognition. But it was all a gimmick for real. You know what I mean? Well, as it turns out, after about the third or fourth tape I put out, you know, getting the units pressed up and hitting the streets with a trunk full and selling them hand to hand, I kind of started realizing that, you know, I ain't never really seen or heard of no well-known mixtape DJ out of VA before. You know, that's not to say there wasn't any other known DJs out here, because it certainly was. 
it just wasn't nobody that was getting national recognition in the mixtape game for it. You know, and certainly not out and about pushing their shit in the streets like I was doing. So, you know, I basically just kind of took that up north hustle mentality and applied it to the mixtape hustle down south. You know, and the results was that my tapes just started gaining a little bit of attention in the streets. You know, and to be honest, it really wasn't for the exclusive intros and the freestyles. You know, even though I'd like to think that those little touches of authenticity is probably what separated my shit from anybody else's stuff who came in the game around that time. But, you know, whatever it was, the word was getting around and my tapes was becoming more and more popular. So much so that, you know, it was to the effect that dudes was actually using the contact info that I would put on the covers to call me and ask about when I was dropping new ones because they wanted to be the first ones with it. You know, it was kind of wild for real because I started to even get some calls from the local rappers hitting me up asking me to play their songs on my next tape. So I guess it was in that moment, you know, that I kind of realized I had something special going on. You know, so I kept up with the formula. Started dropping tapes more often. Realizing that, you know, the more tapes that I got in hand, when I'm out and about slinging them, the more niggas is going to buy from me which in turn obviously leads to more money for me. So I started dropping like two or three joints at the same time. You know, I would drop a up north east coast joint, I'd drop a down south joint, and then I'd either drop an R&B joint or an, instrument, an instrumental. And then I started mailing my shit off to all the different magazines that was real popular at the time too, like The Source and Bob, XXL, Scratch and Ozone. You know, cause they always had these little sections where they would feature a few mixtapes in them. And then, um, you know, lo and behold, my shit winds up getting featured in the source. Shout out to Dave Mays and Benzino for that. You know, they were the first publication that actually showed me some love. And then I made it on the MTV Mixtape Mondays for like three weeks straight. And then like a chain reaction, you know, my shit just started getting featured in all the magazines. Now this is around the time MySpace is jumping off. You know, so I'm on my space and I'm going crazy with that too. And that kind of just enhanced my exposure to a much bigger audience because now it's on the World Wide Web. Pardon self. Shout out to my bro, Ramon Dukes, who used to run Mixtape Mondays up at MTV. Those was legendary times. Definitely. Definitely. And a lot of DJs used to try to get on that. But um, yeah, now I'm actually, you know, I'm getting calls and I'm getting emails from artists, both mainstream and underground, you know, requesting to get placed on my tapes. And I'm getting emails from DJs, you know, that want to collab with me. And, um, you know, I'm starting to get like shout outs and voice drops and all kind of exclusive music from all kind of artists in my inbox. Actually, you know, Laz, I want to say that's probably around the time that you and I crossed paths, you know, when we started working together on different projects. Um, so now, you know, I'm getting recognized and shit like that. My work is showing up in magazines left and right. And it's blowing my fucking mind because, you know, I'm not even really DJing for real. I'm putting together these little compilation type mixes on my computer with the artist drops and sound effects all over them. You know, I did, however, match the beats and the songs that I played, you know, had nice transitions and whatnot from song to song. So it did come together smooth and all that. But by far, I wasn't truly DJing. You know what I mean? But whatever I was doing, you know, it was working and people was noticing. So I just kept it up, you know, and then I upped the ante. And before you know it, you know, I just decided to scrap the rapping all together and focus my attention on the mixtape hustle, you know, because as I said, it really wasn't nobody doing it to this extent before, at least not to my knowledge. So I kind of just felt as though I created my own lane for myself, you know, and I had that up top mixtape hustle mind frame and I just applied it down here before anybody else did. And I made a name for myself doing it. You know, and it was kind of all up from that point on. So then I actually went from hustling hand to hand CDs and parking lots and shit to trying to put them in stores and wholesaling. You know, I started to seek out barbershops and small little convenience stores to buy copies of my stuff in bulk. And that grew to include tobacco shops and gas stations and certain little clothing stores and flea markets, little mom and pop shops. And I used to build these nice little compact uh, display racks, you know, that could easily sit on the store counters. And it would make it easy for the customers to kind of browse through the CDs and it would be easy for the stores to display them without taking up a whole lot of room. 
and they looked like, you know, professional. And um, before long, you know, I was selling like hundreds of units with each drop I had. And I would constantly stay on the prowl for more stores to add to the network. You know, so I started branching out outside of Richmond and started going to places like Petersburg and Charlottesville, and Fredericksburg, and Fairfax, uh, Williamsburg and Hampton, and Norfolk and the Seven Cities and a bunch of other spots all over VA, you know, just trying to recruit more stores to stock my product. And I kept dropping new releases every week. So in essence, like I said, I kind of created my own network of stores that would buy and stock and sell my CDs as soon as I dropped them and delivered them. And like I said, and like I keep saying, nobody else had done this before out here. You know what I mean? So my shit was moving and selling out fast and I was making a killing. You know, the shit was sweet. And it kind of forced me to drop even more often just to keep up with the demand. So now it was also around this time in Richmond that these two brand new indoor flea markets happened to open up. All right, one of them was on Williamsburg Road in the East End, and the other was on in Southside on Hole Street, borderline Chesterfield. And this is like all during the fake sneaker, bootleg, designer shoe and bag craze. You know, the fake designer brand clothing and all that. You know, it was just like a sudden boom, you know, in the way folks was going to these flea markets. The owners, though, they actually came from Florida where, you know, the flea market culture is huge out there and that's been established forever. You know, and they weren't just like selling old and used appliances and secondhand clothes and garage sale shit, you know, that you typically see in the average flea market. Nah, these new flea markets that opened up in Richmond, they was more like low scale shopping malls for real. You know, it was like tons of little stores and shops in them. And even though, you know, a large majority of that stuff was fake, everything for sale that was inside of them was brand new you know the sneakers the shoes the clothes the bags the purses and apparel uh house and kitchen appliances jewelry electronic cell phones they had barber shops in them uh, tattoo shops rim shops car stereo spots even small scale restaurants you know all kind of shit now i ain't never been no flea market shopper you know or a flea market dweller or nothing like that but I gotta give it to the owners, like they really built an experience for a lot of folks. And these places would stay jam packed, especially on the weekends. So, me and one of my homies, we wound up opening a little mixtape spot in both the markets. Now the one on the east end, we actually opened a barbershop and I attached the mixtape spot to it. And on the total opposite side of that building, I opened up like a small CD kiosk type spot. You know, it was the kind of little setup that you would walk by in the middle of the mall, you know, sitting in the middle of the aisles that sold the cologne or the shades or whatever. You know, at both spots, I attached a nice little sound system to play all the latest mixtapes for the people that were shopping and all the other stores that were surrounding me. And I strategically would place my stores between the sneaker hustlers and the guys that sold the clothes and the purses and the bags, just because, you know, they seemed to get the most traffic. So what would happen was people would be there shopping and they would hear the music coming from my spot. And in turn, they would ask me for whatever CD that was I was playing. And once they did that, you know, I knew they was hooked. I wound up starting to pump mixtapes out of these spots like crack in the 80s, man. And I'm talking about making a couple thousand dollars a day, especially like Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. You know, and remember, now you had to actually double that sum because I had a spot pumping the same exact way in the other new flea market across town on Hall Street too. So the shit was amazing to me. You know, I mean, who would have thought I'd be slinging mix CDs and making more money than some of these hand-to-hand -hand drug dealer niggas that was making or sitting on the corners in their hoods, you know, and, and being a whole lot safer too. And then let's not forget, you know, I'm still supplying my network of stores all across VA as well. So I wound up hiring a few people you know, to run my little flea market shops while I made, while I made the CDs and, you know, ran the road making my deliveries to all the stores. It was incredible, man. So, at this point, you know, my for show mixtapes is super popular in the streets and all over Virginia. I'm moving thousands of units, both wholesale and retail. And then, you know, what I realized was that if someone probably another DJ for that matter in each and every state probably doing something very similar to what I'm doing as far as placing their product 
in the stores in their respected areas. And um, that's when um, I kind of got another idea and put that into motion. So what I started doing was reaching out to these other DJs that I had met and I had knew had their own network of stores that was placing product in them. And whether they had a small network or a large one, I made deals with them. You know, I would ask them for anywhere from like a hundred to a thousand or more of their units, depending on how much they could move or their own stuff. And in turn, I would trade off a hundred to a thousand or more of my own units. You know, and we just make an even swap. So in doing this, you know, I was able to accomplish two things. For one, it gave me a whole lot more product to supply in my stores and my network that I created and my own little flea market spots too. So now I'm selling way more product and I got a way bigger variety. And for two, you know, it allowed me to make my presence known in other markets across the country that I would have never been able to touch. So it was a win-win for me and the other guy. You know, and I did this with a lot of DJs. So now, you know, I got product in New York and Jersey, Connecticut, Boston, Philly, Maryland, Florida, the Carolinas, ATL, Tennessee, Houston, New Orleans, the West Coast. I mean, even overseas, you name it. I mean, I was shipping my shit out everywhere you could imagine. Last man, I even think you even got an old clip on your YouTube page where you seen some of my shit on the countertop in a spot in your city. So you already know what I'm talking about. And um, let me mention too, uh, this was also the time that the mixtape websites had become super popular too. Like mixunit.com and mixtrap.com, mixtape kings, mix R us, and rap mullet. So I had one of those joints built too. Moremixtapes.com which in turn just became another small outlet for me to move units worldwide direct to customer. You know, not to mention, not to mention uh, counting all the free download websites that popped up in the bootleggers. And this is also around the time I really started getting nominated for various mixtape and DJ awards. You know, shout out to my man Gennaro at the SEAs, that's the Southern Entertainment Awards, and my man Justo. You know, rest in peace. He always held the biggest mixtape award show in New York. That was always a big deal. You know, then you actually had this new magazine that came out called The Foundation Magazine that was fully dedicated to the mixtape culture and the DJs. You know, shout out to B-Mac for that. He, uh, he wound up giving me a full-page spread and interview in the very first edition. You know, and then he always featured my work in every edition after that. And then I can't forget my girl Armoretta Shaw. You know, who wind up putting together this huge event in D.C. called the Million DJ March, where she literally kind of made me the face of that joint. You know, she had me come to New York for a photo shoot, and then she would she used my pictures for the posters and the flyers and the banners and her website. You know, I even wound up putting together the official mixtape for that event. I'm talking about exposure, I mean, shit, man, it couldn't get no better than that. You know, and then too, I had wound up joining a few of these big DJ coalitions, like the Fleet DJs and the All Out All Stars, the Hustle Squad DJs and the Sniper Squad DJs. And that in turn kind of put me in contact with a whole lot more mainstream artists to get official cosigns from, exclusive music and freestyles, plus voice drops and hosting for my tapes. You know, and I was able to actually do work with a whole lot of artists, you know, like Locks and D Block. I mean, I've done numerous tapes for them. Styles and Sheep, they would always appear in my mixtapes. You know, I actually got YouTube footage of me in the studio with Bully laying down an exclusive freestyle back then for one of my tapes. Large Amount and AP2. I even got a skit from the legendary d Angeletti, a.k.a. the Mad Rapper, you know, which was monumental at the time because ain't no DJs had a Mad Rapper roasting them on no mixtape skit before me. I was the first one to get that. You know, I had Mr. Cheeks from the Lost Boys in the studio with me. Lil Boosie too. All that's on YouTube. You know, and I worked with Future, Capone and Nori, Juvenile, Trader Truth, Ace Hood, Cassidy, Corey Guns, Gorilla Zoe, Trigger the Gambler, and D.V. Elias Christ, Max B. I mean, the list goes on and on, man. There's way too many to name right now, but I'm sure whoever really wants to validate what I'm saying could do a Google search and find all this shit I'm talking about. You know, I said all of that to say, I was really doing my thing at this particular time, you know, and I was considered to be a major, major distributor of mixtapes in my area, 
which is a far stretch from the illegal shit that I was used to distributing in the street just a few years prior. You know, so basically what I'm saying is, if you was a DJ or an artist and you wanted your shit moved through VA, you had to put it in my hands, point blank. I mean, I was moving units for DJ drama at that time, for God's sakes. I was even contacted by some Def Jam reps to do some distro on a couple of Rick Ross projects, just to name a few. You know, but pretty much any and every DJ that wanted that exposure got at me to move their shit. It was lovely. You know, when I was in high demand and I was making a lot of bread doing it. But for real though, I really used to take a liking, man, to certain artists that wasn't really big yet. You know, but they had that potential. And they was on the come up and they was doing their thing heavy. And I always made it my point to showcase him every chance I got. You know, some of my favorite dudes was like uh, Tom Giss. You know, he was actually from Dipset at that time. Own P out of the Bronx, who actually became the freestyle champion on 106 Apart. My man Rain out of North Carolina. Terminology from Boston. Graf from Queens. Ransom out of Jersey. Uh, Giolani and Montega and the whole team official. Laz, you know, you was on just about everything I dropped around that time. You know, not to mention my UGK Records crew out of Texas. My man, he's a Leo and Bankroll Jones and Big Bug, just to name a few. It was so many more, though. You know, and just so y'all know, just so y'all know, I'm a real humble guy overall. But we got to get clear on this fact. You know, it was a lot of artists that I was pushing at that time that wasn't getting a whole lot of burn on other DJs' mixtapes. Some of those DJs that were showing love, they weren't even doing a portion of the numbers that I was doing in the streets. And then too, you know, I was probably moving more units to some other DJs' projects than they was able to move themselves or their own shit. You know, that's real talk and 100% facts. Um, so, just to bring it all in full circle, you know, and give you a total and better understanding of all of what I had going on at that time. For one, you know, I had my whole distribution network of stores all over the state of VA that was wholesaling, you know, and I was making a killing with. Then, you know, I had my couple of uh, flea market CD shops in Richmond that I was selling retail and moving crazy numbers out of. You know, I also had my website that was selling retail, plus I'm shipping worldwide. You know, I was swapping out thousands of units with other DJs all around the country. So my shit was getting noticed and sold just about everywhere. You know, my stuff was getting downloaded like crazy, too, from all the most popular websites. You know, which didn't really put no money in my pocket, but it did give me a lot of exposure. And then, uh, you know, a lot of local and underground artists, they was paying me under the table, you know, for placement on my track list and to mix and host their own personal projects. You know, and then I had mainstream DJs and artist companies writing checks to me for promotion. So I had to actually form a legit LLC company called For Show Promo just to facilitate those uh, payments. Plus I was getting booked, you know, to make appearances and spin at certain clubs every now and then all around the city and the, city and the state. And uh, I mean, I couldn't really ask for much more than that. You know what I mean? I was legally making a fortune and I was having a ball doing it. You know, and then it all came crashing down on me. All of a sudden, you know, when my old associate of mine got caught up in a drug sting and then decided to turn to a confidential informant and got me tangled up in a whole ordeal concerning an old homicide that took place like 15 years prior. You know, and that just so happened to be the beginning of the end of my reign as being Virginia's number one mixtape DJ of all time. And I say that because, you know, there wasn't nobody before me and there still hasn't been anybody after me to follow suit or do what I've done or come even remotely close to the same extent or better. You know, nobody picked it up where I left off when I exited the game. That's a fact. So, the moral to this story is, you know, and the real reason for me even going through all this shit was really to just, just to let y'all know out there that I did have other hustles, you know, and I most certainly did other shit out in these streets besides sell narcotics and firearms and get into all kind of wild ass shit, you know, and I made quite a name and reputation for myself doing it too. I've actually sold just about any and everything you could probably think of in these streets, you know, from cars to clothes the phones and electronics, food, books and magazines, hair care, beauty products, stickers, posters, studio time, and a whole lot of other shit y'all probably be surprised to hear about. You know, music and mixtapes just really happened to be a passion for me, and I was good at it. But really and truly, man, if you're a real hustler, you 
know, when you got discipline and a good work ethic and a great product, you could apply that same street hustle to anything to get some bread legally too. You know, had I not got jammed up by this snitch ass, bitch ass nigga, I more than likely would have been on my way or damn near close to sitting on a million or more by now. That's a fact. You know, and been a household name. Chilling backstage somewhere at the Grammys or the BET Awards, living out my best life. Rubbing elbows and talking shit with all your favorite rappers and entertainers. But you know, man, life is crazy. You know, and these are the cards I was dealt. So I'm still living and I'm still playing my hand. You know, but I ain't gonna be here in prison forever, though. As a matter of fact, my time is almost up and it's getting real short. I'm gonna be back like I never left in no time. Count on that. And it's gonna be just another one of those big redemption stories where, you know, a nigga had it all and lost it and then got it back again type situation. You know, that shit is easy for a nigga like me because I don't sleep. You know, I don't rest. All I know is grind and hustle. That shit is embedded in my DNA. You know, I be running on that rocket fuel you be talking about, guys, while these niggas be out here going nowhere fast. You know what I mean? So, if you listening to this and you know like I know, you need to get on your motherfucking grind, get your mind right, and get to that bag. You know what I mean? Time waits for no man. And ain't no better time than right now. Get up off your ass and do some shit. Learn some things. Invest in something. Shit, invest in yourself. And just keep in mind, you know, that anything worthwhile is going to take some time and effort to accomplish. Great things don't ever happen overnight. You know, they always say Rome wasn't built in a day. Believe that shit. You know what I mean? And if you don't take nothing else out of anything I just said, just remember this statement. Broke niggas waste time trying to save money. While rich niggas spend money trying to save time. Now you think about that. Shout out to you, lads, man. You already know we on that same type time. And shout out to all my real fam out there, too. You already know who you are. All the artists and the DJs I've ever worked with and worked for over the years, shout out to y'all, too. You know, it's been a pleasure. And who knows? You know, we just may see each other again real soon. But I'm out of here for now, though. This your man, Truth, a.k.a. DJ for show. Check out my podcast, Truth Beyond These Walls. Get at me on IG at Truth Beyond These Walls. Stay focused out there. Holla at me. One. I thought I was from the hood till I seen Brooklyn. Jesus Christ. I got off the train. I said, is this the book of Eli? What happened? I feel you. Ayo, hey, LAZ, download two of my greatest albums that I ever put out in my life on my Patreon right now. As above, so below, and blue skies. Free download on my Patreon. Join today. Here. Hey yo, LAZ, make sure you subscribe to WDG Draco on YouTube.